thank you all for, for having me. I'm sorry, I'll, I may try to ad lib the last chunk of the paper just in, in an effort to get us a little bit uh, back on track. So here we go. Although dating back to the early part of the 18th century, little is known about the Zapateo in Peru prior to the 20th century. Scholars and practitioners generally acknowledge that the historical connections between the Zapateo and the there may be uh, connections between the Zapateo and counterpart genres in the Iberian Peninsula and possibly in other parts of the Americas and Africa. Nevertheless, there is a persistent gap between historical and contemporary versions of the genres or, or their accounts. In this paper, I would like to focus on the different ways in which scholars and musicians themselves have sought to bridge that gap using some and, and bringing out some inconsistencies and contradictions to arise as a way of reflecting on the implications of trying to situate genres like the Zapateo in the nexus between written and embodied forms of musical knowledge. Let's begin with some background. The earliest historical references that we have on the Zapateo date from uh, 1712, made by Amédi Fran Francois Fressier, a French traveler chronicling his adventures through South America. Fressier identifies the Zapateo as one of the dances practiced by the upper classes offering a very vague and not particularly complimentary uh, description of the dance. According to him, manly, men generally dance with little to no arm, head, or upper torso movement and without taking off their swords, instead aiming the tip forward so that it could be out of the way whenever they did any kind of leaps or, uh, or, or these kind of move that is kind of like a backwards chain reflection that uh, Fresier kind of describes. The Zapateo itself was characterized by the execution of a uh, repeated heel-toe step combinations, mostly standing in one place, followed by these affirmation genuflections or bows. The musical accompaniment did not impress either. This, uh, with the author singling out, it, singling out as, quote, uh, iconic of the barren taste that predominates in the, in the playing of the harp, the vihuela, and the bandola, which are the, almost the only instruments played in that country. Fresier provided a short transcription uh, of this melody. Uh, to which he subsequently added his own baseline found what he calls the manner of the French harp style. Um, just to give you a little sense of what this sounds like, it's, I kind of threw it in finale real quick. After that early historical reference, no mention is found to the Zapateo until the first half of the 20th century. These latter accounts of the dance are based largely on the research and interviews conducted by noted Afro-Peruvian poet, writer, and folklorist Nicomedes Santa Cruz uh, during the 1950s, and also through some of the uh, ethnomusicological and folk folkloristic research that took place in the 1970s, observing enduring or, or, or uh, contemporary practices of, of the Zapateo. During this, time, uh, during this time, meaning between the 1950s and the 1970s, the Zapateo undergoes a process of revival and canonization as part of an emerging complex of music and dance genres associated with Peru's Afro-Peruvian population. The Afro-Peruvian revival movement was predict, uh, predicated on bringing attention to a population that had been rendered largely invisible by national identity debates during the 19th and early 20th century. These debates were largely centered on whether the heart of the Peruvian nation should be located within the pre-Columbian legacy of the Incas associated with the Indian region of the country or the predominantly Iberian-derived Iberian Criollo coastal culture. Afro-Peruvians who primarily inhabited the coast region, coastal region of the country were assumed to have been largely assimilated into the bottom strata of the dominant Criollo coastal culture. Most Criollos claimed that although Afro-Peruvians and to a lesser degree mestizo cultural practices and sensibilities had over time helped to transform and improve the, um, upon the cultural musical heritage inherited from Spain, that, it, that these influences played secondary if not subordinate role uh, when conceptualizing the relationship between Europe, Africa, and Amerindian uh, cultural influences in, in the national identity. One of Santa Cruz's main sources of information about the Zapateo was noted guitarist and frequent collaborator Vicente Vasquez. And somebody mentioned my colleague Monica Rojas. This is actually a painting by hers. Uh, that she made. Um, he was uh, one of the few remaining keepers of musical and oral, uh, oral knowledge that since the turn of the 20th century was under a threat of disappearance, largely the result of more and more Afro-Peruvians feeling a great deal of social pressure to assimilate in order to improve their social standing and economic prospects. 
Vázquez was part of a long lineage of music and dance masters. His father, Porfirio Vázquez, a famous poet and dancer of his own right, had moved to Lima from nearby province of Alcayama in the 1930s to teach the first academy devoted to Peruvian folk dance. Vicente and his brother Abelardo would become uh, two of the major figures in the Afro-Peruvian revival movement that lasted into the 1970s, with younger siblings, children, and grandchildren continuing the legacy to the present day. It's a very well-known, noted family of musicians. The Santa Cruz, by the way, also. Um, according to Vasquez, at the turn of the 20th century, there remained two distinct styles of zapateo in Peru. The first, associated with Lima and surrounding provinces like Aucayama, was a dance performed in what is referred to as desafío or contrapunto, a form of competitive dance where male participants sought to outdo one another. Accompanied by a guitar scenario, the performers would take turns presenting a series of choreographic motifs uh, known as pasadas that would be developed into longer choreographic episodes known as terminos. The opposing, dan the opposing dancer would then start by reiterating the same set of pasadas, but then kind of elaborate their own longer and more acrobatic terminos in response. The contest would continue with each dancer offering more and more elaborate and virtuosic dance sequences, avoiding any repetition until a winner was declared usually by an adjudicating judge, which usually was a master dancer uh, or, or elder in, in a community. Versions of this style have continued to endure amongst families of professional musicians in Lima, and more recent decades it started to also be taught at folklore schools and dance academies. And in fact, uh, what you see there is a picture of kind of what would be a kind of more formal, let's call it stage version of the Zapateo. There's a little bit of acting and, and, and involved visual when you see those kinds of performances, but a lot of the underlying competition goes on. It's actually almost identical to the stuff that people would do like at home when they're kind of just dancing to have a good time. So to give you a little bit of a sense of one of these com contemporary practices, uh, there's, this is an excerpt. Unfortunately, we don't have time to kind of show you the multiple dancers going back and forth. So I'm just going to give you a sense of how the dance works. Uh, this is about one minute of just one dancer uh, kind of doing her thing. So I'm sorry, the bottom part of the frame got cut off, so you actually couldn't see the feet. But um, in the interest of going on, at least hopefully you got a little bit of a sense. OK. Now, the second style comes from the neighborhood, uh, from neighbor and southern department of Ica, in particular the rural areas of in the province of Chincha. This style of Zapateo, although it can be performed in, in competitive settings, does not follow the same strict rules. Using Instead, the cheers and applause of the onlookers uh, to select the winner. The dance can be accompanied by guitar or sometimes violin, um, ostinato, but it can also be performed to tunes by different kinds of local genres uh, or performed without accompaniment at all. Another distinct feature of this style is, the, the, as you can see in, in the picture, the, um, the dancing can be done with, fur, uh, with, with bare feet, and is also oftentimes used in non-competitive se settings for the uh, Christmas celebrations. Oh, the, actually, the celebrations are happening between Christmas Day and the Epiphany on, on uh, January 6th in many towns uh, in the South. Uh, just as an aside, that boy that you see dancing right there is actually the same person as this guy right here. Um, so historians and music scholars have tried to con Historians and music scholars have tried to connect Frazier's brief descriptions to contemporary performances of the Zapateo, an exercise that has required major 
uh, making a number of assumptions as well as a fair amount of interpolation uh, interpretation um, in order to fill in the gaps. As early as 1939, historian linguist Fernando Romero uh, referenced Frazier's narrative, the one I just discussed, listening, uh, listing the bandola as one of the musical instruments historically associated with Af Afro-Peruvians. The odd thing is that uh, Frazier's narrative actually does not mention any Afro-Peruvians anywhere in, in the thing. He's just mainly talking about the aristocracy dancing um, at all. So, in fact, Frazier dev uh, devotes large sections of activities to the upper classes in Lima describe and also describing indigenous populations. And in many ways, is uh, an example of something that was already happening in the 18th early 18th century in Peru, which was the progressive invi invisibilization of Afro-Peruvian communities. Uh, there would be a pass in, in Frasier's text, you say, oh yeah, well, people were dining, and yes, there, there, there were the servants, and in passing, it might get mentioned that one of them was black, but, but other than that, there's no description of those communities and the kinds of music that they do. How, you know, it's odd that even though you have that omission, in the, in the wake of the Afro-Peruvian revival movement, Frasier's asser assertion that the bandola was an instrument played by Afro-Peruvians has continued to be reiterated by many different people. And it, it is something that provides to many a missing link between the 18th century dance performed by the Limeño aristocracy and, a con and the con contemporary Afro-Peruvian practice. This, that, Lack of documentary evidence does not mean that there are no grounds for positing that there is some sort of continuity between these two versions of the genre, and possibly by extension to counterpart genres in Spain. Nicomel Santa Cruz and another ethnomusicologist uh, who sadly passed away recently, Chalena Vasquez, uh, research on the Zapateo uh, was largely a result of information with uh, Vicente Vasquez. And he also discusses the existence of another dance called the Aguenieve, a form. Um, another form of comparing male dance involving complex, complex footwork. This practice disappeared by the er, turn of the 20th century, but Vasquez had heard many of his grandparents and, and other elders kind of describe it. Something that makes the Aguenieve particularly interesting is that um, unlike the Zapateo, it was a dance that involved, a, one of the rules was that your heels could not touch the ground. You could only use your toes, the balls of your feet, and the side of your feet uh, to dance. And, and in fact, a move that um, Kata doesn't, doesn't use there, but the next answer does. This kind of brushing of the feet is referred to as the escobilla, very similar to what we find in Colombia, uh, that was actually considered to be kind of like the center uh, motif associated with the Um Now, generally speaking, you know, a, 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 con a connection to a word like zapateo, zapateado, might, might imply a connection about dance, but it's kind of difficult to kind of establish how much that is just a coincidence or etymology of simili similarity rather than an actual dance carrying over from Spain to the other one. A little bit of a stronger evidence here is that uh, we find both in the late uh, 17th century reference to Zapatero and Agua de Nieve in Spain. Uh, or, and, and, and so that there might actually be a little bit more of a connection. But rather than rely on that, what I like to do is kind of focus a little bit more in other things beyond kind of etymological similarities that kind of suggest a, a, an important continuity theory. From a musical perspective, there are some general features, and, um, many of which have been discussed in other papers here, uh, to point to a connection. There's similar instrumentation, a predilection for a company based on rhythmic and melodic rocinados, and the emphasis of the dance on male participants. Although, as you saw, Catalina Rol is not male. That's actually uh, something that's changed quite a bit in the last 20 years. Uh, so a stronger case can be made by actually looking at the context of what's going on. Um, while there's no doc documentation supporting that uh, the musicians playing the bandola in, in Frasier's description were Afro-Peruvian. There are actually a number of other um, sources that point out that Afro-Peruvian musicians uh, routinely play similar instruments like the bandola, the vihuela, uh, the guitar, in a lot of very kind of similar settings, usually playing for, for aristocratic parties. There are also historical sources that show that as early as the 17th century, much of the music performed in high society events were performed by black musicians. Furthermore, Furthermore, throughout the colonial period, activities like music, poetry, dance instruction, uh, particularly uh, aimed at members of the upper classes, were provided by Afro-Peruvians, giving uh, these members um, of the community particular social, social economic strategies. So what ends up happening over time is that you end up getting family-based guilds of dancers, musicians, actors, uh, poets, uh, whose, whose life revolves around um, basically as a service industry for the upper classes artistic service industry, let's call it. 
Now, it is important to note then that many of the musicians that Santa Cruz and Vasquez, uh, Chalena Vasquez, uh, begin to talk to are actually representatives of these families of musicians who have been actually doing this for many generations going back. And in fact, the Santa Cruz family themselves, they trace their lineage through several actors and performers going into the early part of the 19th century. Uh, there's De Vasquez, uh, uh, the dancer you saw is actually Catalina Robles, another uh, well kind of known and important family. And so the fact that you have this continuity in practice also suggests that there is a connection there. So this is the part where I'm going to ad lib a little bit. So what do we make out of this? So a lot of the ways of connecting these two genres together is is tied not so much to looking at historical documentation. Historical documentation can only get us so far. But there's always the danger with, when, when kind of doing these kinds of connections that we might be seeing connections or similarities where, where there, there aren't any. A, an interesting idea that, it, that, it, that I think is very helpful is Diana Taylor's of, of idea of archive and repertoire, right? So when the archive doesn't get, get us very far, we can kind of go into the idea of repertoire, this idea of embodied knowledge that gets, gets passed down from one performer to another to another as a way of trying to pin down what other things might be going on. But there's kind of like a catch-22 about this theory. Repertoire is supposed to be ephemeral. It's supposed to be timeless. It's going to be changing. So when you kind of try to use repertoire to establish a clear historical timeline, you're actually taking that out of the repertoire and putting that in the archive. In the process, something gets lost. And I think that something to be, um, to be careful of with, when doing this is trying to figure out exactly how, how to handle the repertoire. Sadly, in, in, in a lot of the um, discussions about the Zapateo and perhaps in some other Afro-descendant genres in, in South America, the tendency has been to think of archive and repertoire as Western and non-Western. So that when we talk about complex rules, like the ones we have about the Zapateo, oh, it's obviously a Spanish uh, legacy. But when we talked about virtuosic dance, say, oh, yeah, well, that's clearly black and African because people you know, are, are you know, naturally adept or, or athletic or, or, or whatnot. And so there, there's this kind of an interesting way in which if we're not careful, what those, um, what those kinds of presuppositions do is actually replicate the very kind of nationalist narratives that invisibilized Afro-Peruvians to begin with, right? The idea that it is pri primar primarily a European trunk that has some grafts into it from other places, but it, you know, it's, it's an oak tree with some grafts, but it remains an oak tree, right? Maybe a funny looking oak tree, or, or to use the, the kind of uh, popular metaphor that gets used uh, oftentimes in Cuba and other parts of the Caribbean, the, the idea of the stew, right? So it's the pepper for the stew, but it is not the stew itself. And, uh, and so that, that is one of the problems. I think one way of doing this, and, and with this, this I will finish, is refocusing on the relationship that dancers have to this music and how their perception of music and their engagement with rhythm in particular is something that is actually allows to understand the dance first before we look at the historical background and project all sorts of assumptions as to where do these things come from. So I will finish with that. Thank you. <laughs>
I'm sorry. But Aguanir is no longer performed. It's uh, actually a dance that stopped being performed in the early part of the 20th century. So there's descriptions of what it looked, vague descriptions of what it looked like as far as the, the footwork, but nobody has been performed. Uh, one of the toques for, uh, for the Aguanir, uh, Vicente Vasquez knew. And so in the late 1950s, when San Santa Cruz actually published a book with like all sorts of recordings with samples of all the different Afro-Peruvian genres, and he actually, uh, and Vasquez actually plays the melody of the Alpinier yet, which is this little short melody, largely on a Phrygian kind of doing a little Spanish cadence uh, kind of a thing. Um, some, uh, some guitarists who have heard that recording have kind of learned that part. And occasionally when you hear, see a Zapateo performance, they're usually, usually done with tokes in, in major key because people kind of tend to think they're more interesting and a little bit livelier, but occasionally people who are kind of like trying to push the envelope will, will kind of do the the, the lesser perform uh, zapateos and menor, and sometimes within that they will kind of throw in uh, the the aguinere toque. But but the dance steps remain just the zapateo dance. We that that dance has not been um, re you know recreated. Uh-huh. Right. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean that 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 may very well be. Um, I I I think that you find some connections. I mean there there's, you know, obviously that that melodic accompaniment from from the 18th century is it's in 3-8, which is a little bit different than the kind of more 6-8, 3-4 uh, that contemporary players use now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's a continuity. I think what, what is more difficult to ascertain is to what, you know, to what degree can we separate these things? To, to what degree can some of these things be attributed specifically to being part of the Spanish heritage uh, or, or even more complicatedly, the African heritage? Because African heritage can be so many different things. Uh, you know, we're talking about a very large continent with people with many different ethnicities and languages and, and cultural practices, and to kind of reductively just kind of refer to that as African uh, becomes a, a little bit problematic. And uh, so there are connections there, um, but we are oftentimes making them at, at, at the level of very broad generalities, I feel, right? Dancing to an ostinato, I mean, that's, that's like saying, uh, I don't know, Russian music and, and Spanish music are the same thing because they both use one, four, five chord progressions, right? I mean, they're, they're both European and there's some overall generic underlying thing that, that is underneath it, uh, but there's also a whole much deeper level of granularity and deep detail that kind of point out to these being two very different things. And one of the things, I'm just, to kind of add into a part that I couldn't get into my paper. Uh, one of the dangers with focusing on the repertoire and not being kind of self-conscious about how we're invoking these, these connections is that you notice that oftentimes most of the assumptions and suppositions that establish connections in between dances tend to be a lot more liberal when we're talking about music that is African derived or indigenous derived than when it's European derived. And part of it is, has to do with just documentation. Uh, but, but I think that there's another part to it, right? I think because a lot of these, these kind of narratives oftentimes are departing from sources that, that are coming from particular nationalist narratives that are inform, uh, imagining things in a particular way, I think we need to kind of question, you know, something in the back of our heads to kind of tingle when you kind of see that very easy uh, connection and, and, and begin to ask, well, what else is going on? I mean, if, if you look at a lot of those original nationalist narratives, the assumption there is that indigenous music or African music to a certain degree, because it hasn't been written down, because it's not literate, is somehow more timeless. It changes less over time. It's, you know, and no, it's, there's an absence of documentation of it, and it leads us to assume that that's what's going on in a way that we oftentimes don't necessarily do with the European side of the heritage. And so I think we, we need to be a little bit careful. In 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think that there needs to be a kind of uh, uh, what a friend of mine in Peru refers to as autocriticismo, right? Uh, in, in in how we invoke these things. It, it, in when you have a lot of documentary evidence, it's really easy to say, okay, this is a likely connection, this is a less likely connection. When we're talking about things that are less documented, uh, we need to be a little bit more cautious. And it's, but it, but it's funny when when there is enough of a body, of a written body, that there's a very clear gaping hole. Everybody's very careful about how to connect through thread through that hole because you are concerned that you might be over reading into something when you're dealing with things that don't have an equally substantially documented body all of a sudden all of a sudden we become a little more liberal with our uh, interpretations of that I mean and, and it's natural because otherwise you would not be able to say anything and and, and 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 the point is not to not make those connections. I think very interesting things come out of those connections and debates, and musicians themselves make them, which is also part of the reason why you should be a subject of your study, right? Uh, the fact that a musician believes that there is a very clear and direct connection between something that happens in Peru and something that happens in Angola, regardless of whether you can substantiate or not, becomes a really important part of the motivation behind why people see the dance the way they do and, and the kinds of things that they do. So, so we sh it's, it's not something to be dismissed, but it should be, as scholars, I think we should at the same time meet it with the same kind of level of healthy skepticism as, as anything else. Right, they, they per, in Peru it's the same thing. The purpose was if you put people who speak different languages and have different religious beliefs, the only way to get through in society is to learn Spanish and become Catholic. And, and so it was, it was, a, it was a, a strategy to, rather than using segregation like it was used in the, in the United States, is to assimilate people into the bottom strata of, of colonial society. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, the interesting thing with a lot of these is that, that you know, when you're looking at syncretic forms, uh, one, you know, one of the things that makes syncretism happen is that in two different cultures, you're going to have things that people are going to recognize as somewhat similar, and that allows for the syncretism to happen, right? So the fact that you do have lineages of musicians, for example, in, in certain kind of musical practice in, in the Iberian Peninsula, but that that same idea of master musicians being disseminated through lineages is also happening in different parts of West Africa kind of helps facilitate some of these things kind of enduring, right? Uh, 
the, the exploring, what do you want to call it, Sergio Altera, Gimiola, uh, that, that you find in different kinds of flamenco and other Spanish folk music, and, and, and kind of some of the similarities are not exactly the same thing, but some of the similarities that you find with, uh, with, uh, with different kinds of West African rhythms in 6, 7, 8, that also allows for a lot of that uh, in between to happen. But I think what, what ends up, what, what becomes particularly interesting though is that for all of those, for us to, in retrospect, interpret that, uh, one thing that is absolutely necessary is ambiguity. What allows us to draw different connections and say, well, my theory is A as opposed to B, or, and so has somebody say, well, no, I don't think it's this because I'm based on the evidence, this is what I see. Those kinds of debates are based on the fact that these are ambiguous things and they're debated. And so we need to then ask, what are, our, as scholars, when we're writing these things, what are our own politics or our own life experiences, not necessarily even politics, that are kind of informing why is it that we're making one particular chain of, uh, of choices as opposed to another, rather than saying, well, no, this is, this is you know, the best scholarship can say right now. I mean, it's, it's the fact that it has been predominantly played by uh, or performed by Afro-Peruvian musicians for almost 300 years now. Does, does, does that mean it should be still considered to be Spanish or, should it, or is that enough time that it could be considered Afro-Peruvian, right? So. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's necessarily an issue of setting the record straight because setting the record straight uh, implies that there's a master narrative that we that has yet to be discovered. I, 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 I mean, in some cases, yeah, you might find enough doc score tool documentation about something that unequivocally allows you to say this happened and this happened and this happened. Um, but to be honest, in a lot of this music, I, th I, I think that the spec there's always going to remain a certain amount of speculation. And so in light of that certain amount of speculation, then the, the research project, I think, needs to become a little bit different. And the research project becomes, I think, twofold. One is to kind of figure out, you know, are, are, are there particular political positions that, that, that are necessary in order to kind of further particular projects? So in, in the case of Afro-Peruvian music, uh, you know, a, a lot of interest in Afro-Peruvian music grew up by, because musicians themselves tried to show the Peruvian government that Afro-Peruvians deserve a seat at the table as far as being considered citizens rather than people who have completely lost their culture and disappeared. Uh, and so the revival comes out of saying, no, look, we have things that are distinct. We have things that are different. Now, part of that revival, part of that, because some, some practices had disappeared quite a bit and there were a lot of gaps, involved Afro-Peruvian musicians back in the 50s and, and 60s uh, having to fill in gaps by borrowing from other places, in some cases quite liberally, you know, from Cuba, from Brazil, from other places. As a scholar, that's an interesting question and you want to mention it, but, but, but I think that there's ways of navigating that particular narrative uh, by centering, uh, by, by putting uh, out front that these were choices that Afro-Peruvian musicians were forced to make because they, at that time, did not have another option. So Afro-Peruvian musicians added these things liberally, but then they constructed a mythology of origins that goes from Africa to Peru, not mentioning that this came from Cuba, not mentioning this came from Brazil. And, and that was vital because if the government was going to recognize you as a special community, you could not say, oh, well, we lost these things, but we sort of think that it's kind of Cuban, and we added from here, and we added from there. That was not a, that was not a political choice that was available. The fact that there's now an, an entire month dedicated to kind of like Afro-Peruvian culture in Peru, that there's NGOs dedicated to all of these things, is predicated on the work of these musicians from the 1950s. So as scholars, we have a responsibility to go in there and not simply say, oh, I'm bursting a bubble, this is a lie, this is made up. This is, 
uh, because you're undermining that very project, right? So you need to learn how to, to write about that. And one way to do that is to take the position of the musicians and the political project and kind of speaking from that vantage point and on that behalf. So that doesn't mean that you shouldn't be critical of, 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 of that same project. I think, and in fact, I think a, a, a lot of my friends who are still involved in this, uh, they welcome the criticism. And, and it's interesting to talk to young Afro-Peruvian musicians now because they are very much aware of what their grandparents, or in some cases great-grandparents, did back in the 40s and 50s. And they know that this was made up. And, they know that, and, and now these people can talk about those things much more openly. Uh, and, and so they're interested in the criticisms because they feel that they're now at a, at a place where they can move on in a different direction. So, uh, so I think that's great. And the other thing is maintaining a dialogue with the musician communities themselves so that, that you are, and sometimes that can be a very hard dialogue because people don't want to hear what you have to say. Uh, so you have to learn how to approach this and how to learn how to engage with this. I, I think this conference is great precisely because we have such a range of people from academics to performers to people who do a little bit of everything precisely because it kind of helps generate that kind of larger conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.